Welcome to Guide to Self with your host, Dr. John Schindler. Back with you with The Lonely Man's Guide to Resiliency. And yes, that's my mug there on the front page, <laughs> whether or not I like it. <laughs> All right, resiliency. Uh, there was a study done by Dennis Charney at Mount Sinai School of Medicine a few years ago, which was absolutely outstanding. He's done research on 750 Vietnam veterans who were kept in solitary confinement and tortured for roughly six, seven, or eight years. And they came out of that experience relatively healthy. They were able to come back into what we know as civilization and be productive and successful and thrive. So how do you do that? How do you be kept in solitary confinement, be tortured, and then come back in to this society and act as if nothing happened? How do you maintain that degree of resiliency? How do you bounce? That's the question for today. And if you take a look at the bear down there on the right, bouncing on the log, what I want you to do is think about yourself from now on as that material that would bend but wouldn't break, kind of like that log. So you're the log and the bear is life, let's say, because life is always going to be jumping up and down on you, scratching you, clawing you, throwing injustices in your face. The trick is learning how to bounce back. And that's what we'll be talking about today. So the question became, what was it that these 750 Vietnam vets had in common in terms of their psychological makeup that allowed them to be this amazingly resilient? So here's what we found out. We found out that number one, they all have a pretty good sense of humor. <laughs> like the little gingerbread man in the cup of milk. Eat me! Reminds me of Shrek. So sense of humor, very important. Be quick to laugh, be easy to smile. So if you're a lonely guy, one of the best things you can do is develop that quick and easy sense of humor and wear a smile on your face as often as you can, let's say. Number two, they were realistically optimistic. Now, realistic optimism is a talk unto itself, so I'm just going to scratch the surface here. However, the idea here is to look for the best outcome in most situations. I say most because you don't always want to be optimistic. You don't want to be foolishly optimistic. Uh, let's say, for example, you're at a party and you're the key bearer, you've got the bag of keys, and a friend comes up and he's drunk and he wants his car keys and he wants to go home. You don't want to be foolishly optimistic in that case and say, sure, Brad, here you go, here's your keys, good luck getting home there, champ. And he goes off and drives into another car and kills four people. No, bad idea. When the stakes are high, you want to be cautious. You want to use good sense and judgment. However, most of the situations in our lives are not high stakes. They're low to medium stakes, low to moderate. And in those cases, you want to be more optimistic. So you want to learn to cultivate an optimistic attitude. Third, you want a high ratio of positive to negative emotions. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means that the research is converging and we're finding out more and more from different sources in different areas that one of the key ingredients to resiliency is a high ratio of positive emotions such as joy, love, pride, awe, curiosity to negative emotions, fear, anger, sadness, disappointment. And what we're really shooting for is a three to one ratio. So you want three times as much positive emotion in your life as negative. 
Now, I know you might not be there right now. I sure as hell wasn't 10 years ago. I was probably the opposite of that, one to three. Maybe. However, this is a learnable skill, and you can learn to cultivate and create more positive emotions in your life, and you can learn to turn the volume down on your negative emotions. And that's part of what I help people do. Number four is altruism. We know that one of the best ways to keep up good spirits, to keep yourself in a positive frame of mind, is by doing good things for other people. So kind, the, the old random acts of kindness idea. And in the prison camps, the prisoners would do kind acts for other prisoners, even for other guards. And it pulls you outside of yourself. It takes that spotlight of your attention and refocuses it on the outside rather than on the inside. So rather than focusing on your own misery and deprivation that you have in this prison camp, you turn the spotlight of your attention on someone else and you do something kind for them and you feel better about yourself regardless of where you are. Number five is moral compass. To me this means values. Do you know your top five values in life? And most people that I speak to don't and that's all right. There are ways to identify those top values. And what I'm talking about here is basically, what are you willing to die for? But more importantly, what are you willing to live for? What things in your life are so important that you are willing to give them your all? Faith and spirituality is number six. This is a tough one for me in the sense that my background's in psychology, so I don't feel that I'm in a position to tell people who or what to believe in, if anything. However, there is research out there that says, to the extent that you believe in a kind, loving, and forgiving God, your mental health is a little bit better, and you're, you've got higher well-being, greater well-being. Um, so faith and spirituality is a big one. It's also very important when things are desperate and your life feels like it's in the gutter, as these men were in the POW camp. Seventh, they had a role model. So it could have been a friend, a brother, a father, uh, someone in the military, but it was someone that they looked up to, respected, admired, and wanted to be like. And the interesting thing is the role models typically were not in the prison camp with them. They were only there in their minds. So it was only in their heads where they would recreate talks that they had with their role models or would they would create new conversations by asking their role models something like what would you do in my case what would you do if you were here now what advice would you give me and they would continue the conversation to the best of their ability in this way eighth social sports critical for resiliency as well as happiness and a thriving life to have social support. It could be family, it could be friends. In this case it was other prisoners and what they did was they developed a limited alphabet using a five by five grid, five columns, five rows, They put one letter in each one, each block, and using their tin cups, they could tap on the stone wall the number of rows across and the number of columns to identify the first letter, and then they'd do it again for the second letter. Now obviously this takes a lot of time to tap out all the letters and all the words in one sentence, yet it allowed them to stay connected and cohesive, and it allowed them to talk about their dreams and aspirations and what they were going to do once they got out of the prison and that helped keep hope alive. Number nine, they faced their own fears. So they were trained to face their fears plus they actually went out and did it again and again and again. It's critical to face your own fears. It's a way of life. It's something I've done for the past 25 years and it's really important to understand that courage does not mean the absence of fear. Courage is the ability to overcome your fears. 
You see, we're all human. So we all have fears. There are some things that we're all afraid of.